Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Birdsong. I'm your host, as always, Caillou, and in this episode, we have Tim Lowe joining us. Tim Lowe is an Australian biologist and an author of several books and numerous articles on nature and conservation. His seventh book, Where Song Began, Australia's Birds and How They Changed the World, became the first nature book ever to win the Australian Book Industry Awards Prize for Best General Nonfiction in 2015. An earlier book of his, Feral Future, inspired the formation of an NGO, the Invasive Species Council, and his earlier books helped popularise Australian bush tucker. Four of his books have won national prizes, and alongside these books, his reports, articles, and talks have contributed to ecological thought and environmental policy in Australia and beyond. And written for a general audience, his books have attracted broad academic interest and serve as recommended reading in many university courses. So I enjoyed this conversation with Tim, and I'm pleased to release this as another episode of Birdsong. And that's enough from me here in this intro. Let's get straight into it. I trust you'll find value in this conversation between Tim Lowe and I to carry with you on your own path forward. Oh, and I just remembered that there were some technical difficulties at the start of our conversation. For the first couple of minutes, there is some knocking interference sounds coming from Tim's microphone, which we sort out reasonably quickly. But if you're watching this on video, then you'll see the state of his headset that he's wearing with the microphone piece dangling beside his ear and it kept knocking the cord as he was moving around but like I said it only lasts a couple of minutes and then it dissipates throughout the rest of the conversation as I prompt him to sort it out so all good guys enjoy <laughs> well look now that we've we've hit record we're good to go so I just want to formally say once again uh, thank you thank you for offering up some of your time to join me on the show and it's very much appreciated, mate. And I'm sure there are going to be many listeners that will be delighted to hear from you. So just big thanks for being here, Tim. No, thank you for talking to me with a, about a great topic. Mm. So I like to jump into these conversations by asking all of my guests a bit of a similar question. And the nature of this question does not require any specific predilections, Um to answer appropriately. So I would love to ask and to know, immersing yourself in the field of biology, ornithology, nature, conservation, amongst many other related themes, what have you come to learn about or experience when it comes to the sacred? Like what does that word or that feeling of the sacred mean to you? And how do you relate, relate to that as a scientist who has immersed himself in learning about and connecting with nature in all these various forms? It's not a word I would use, so I suppose I would put it to one side and say, what's a way of answering it without using that word? And it is, I mean, there's this throbbing, pulsating thing, nature, all these other species, all this multiplicity that I think most people are not very cognizant of, they're not very alive to it. And that, yeah, it's just really exciting. I think that I have a sense of community that, for me, all the other species that are part of it are so important. And, you know, I'm listening to the birds. I'm thinking, well, I can't really understand what they're saying, but I can understand bits of it. And so that sense that they're alive, like I'm alive, they're communicating, like I'm communicating. Uh, we try and understand other people. I mean, we, you know, we have to if we're, if we're to get on in a society and have good relationships. I want to have good relationships with other species. And so trying to understand how they kind of operate, uh, knowing that I never really can, but just that amazing sense that I'm alive, they're alive, we have something in common, and then all these things that we don't have in common. I just find that so um, enriching uh, in ways that go beyond language, and so mm. that's getting towards spiritual, getting towards sacred. Um, I think that we have to value them. I mean, the, the, the beauty... The, the right they have to be able to continue their lives. So, so there's a kind of sacredness in the sense that it is just, you know, deeply immoral, the idea that people should presume they can just push them out of the way to meet their own needs. So um, it's those sort of areas that are really important to me, that mm. nature is so much bigger than human culture, it's so much bigger than me. And really it's not one thing. I, you know, I think that we should call it nature's, it's a, it's a plurality. Mm. Um, 
and that yeah the sense that when I go into a forest there's just all this stuff going on around and um, it's educational it's really uplifting mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. it's um, it, it you know it's the source of meaning in my life yeah yeah I like the way that you answer that question and before I touch on this next one I might get, just get you to try and rejig your little um, earring that you've got there. <laughs> That's great. The earpiece that's seen better days. Yeah, I just had a bit of yeah. clanging in the background. So as I mentioned to you, this kind of intersection between a few of these words, nature, natural, wild, wilderness, and perhaps diving into this may lay a foundation of understanding or nuance maybe as we continue on. So I'm certainly keen to hear your perspective on the distinctions between nature, natural, wild, wilderness, any other words that come to mind. And of course, yourself and our listeners might be familiar with people uh, such as Gary Snyder. Uh, he talks about this, for instance, in his book, The Practice of the Wild. And you also wrote something which I found to be interesting, which is that it's our concepts of nature, they don't often match up what we actually observe in our environments. So for example, we might think that the native animals, they prefer their natural habitats or their natural foods when observation of the various creatures that have adapted to the cities and suburban backyards as opportunists taking advantage of the human created habitats might suggest otherwise. So what's your perspective that you like to offer up here when we're talking about these things? Um, there's about 20 different questions in there. So <laughs> totally. One or two to answer. Actually, you look pretty blurry. I don't know whether your focus has actually changed or whether it's just what I see on my screen. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I think, I mean, all of the, we use all these singular words. So wilderness, nature. Uh, and as, as you rightly point out, in a city or, let's, let's, let's take a, a forest and we bulldoze it to put up a housing estate. I and mean, it's, it's a terrible that that is still going on. And um, so you can have a, make a general statement like that is really bad for nature. But if you look at what will happen, if the suburban area is rich in trees and people have got compost heaps and flowers, species will move in. Now, the way that was thought about, if you go back, say, 40 years, people say, well, that's just a few of the really hardy survivors trying to hang on the forest is gone they've got no choice but to pretend that this suburban area is a city but if you actually look at a lot of the studies that have been done say um blue tongue lizards that i have in my garden i can hear that bangling the blue tongue yeah you know, we know that there's actually higher densities of blue tongue lizards in a suburban brisbane garden than there are out in a forest and it's not hard to understand why you've got a lot of introduced snails that like eating those. Uh, people have fruiting shrubs, little berries drop off, land on the ground. There's heaps of cover, you know, look, rocky beds, uh, wooden, um, you know, people might have sleepers around the edge of a garden bed. So great hiding places that people water the garden, they fertilise, big juicy grasshoppers. So that can actually do quite well. I mean, I get might get run over, so there's, there's hazards. Mm. Um, but of course, there's hazards in the bush as well. They might get hit by a, a bird of prey that isn't in the city. Mm -hmm. So this whole idea that uh, what humans do is bad for nature, it is really too simplistic. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's something in thinking about the nuanced ways in which it's not true that we can take some small comfort from. So uh, we, we sh I mean, it would be terrible to say that bulldozing a forest is okay because there are some birds and lizards and possums that like the suburbs we put up in its place. I'm not, certainly not saying that's okay. But on the other hand, I think for a lot of people who care about nature, you can get this really negative self-image that we're this horrible monster species that everywhere we go, we, you know, we're like a, a killer ray zapping everything and how horrible and awful that is and how guilty we must feel. I mean, we're not going to be our best as environmentalists mm. if we're feeling really negative about ourselves. So I think there's a space in which we can operate where we're not condoning environmental destruction, but we are acknowledging that, say, um, satin barrel birds, I mean, they love blue plastic. <laughs> it's great. Mm. It's, you know, they had feathers and blueberries before, but hey, when you put the blueberry there, 
it rots away. You know, it's gone after a couple of weeks. It's turned all green or brown, mm. a bit of blue plastic. Years later, da da da, there it is, and mm. bigger. You know, like you get a big bit of blue plastic or a big long straw. There's no berry that looks like that. So they become technological innovators. They're benefiting from our blue plastic, mm. and that it's really nice. I think to be able to. Uh, think that well in a sense i don't know whether we've, we've helped satin bowerbirds but i think they have made their life more interesting you know like they're really smart birds and they could get all this weird blue stuff that they didn't have before so they're probably you know like the idea that you should bring up babies with stimulating toys or they won't reach their full intellectual potential i'm not quite sure that with with bowerbirds because they've now got access to all these kind of weird and wonderful objects that they steal from us that they've got the potential to extend their intelligence, their aesthetic values into places that they haven't gone before. And that you know, it's nice to think that we've done that for them. And mm. what I really like about thinking that way is that everything Indigenous people hear for 50,000 years, we know that bowerbirds were stealing from their camps. And so this kind of learning stealing from us has been going on for tens of thousands of years. You know, we've just added, you know, new technologies, new little thing, bits and pieces they can, they can steal. That's so interesting. And yeah, you know, from what we might call a, a higher perspective, then I guess you could say it, the, well, from our, from humanity's perhaps highest self, I guess, or highest, um, I don't know how I want to language this, but, you know, essentially that we enhance mm -hmm. nature. But I guess the reality is that we are not from that perspective where we just cause death and destruction every, everywhere we go. And perhaps we may not ever reach a place where we are fully enhancing nature to the fullest potential. Maybe it's somewhere in between as we continue on our own evolutionary path. Yeah, well, certainly my sense of nature is something that we can't enhance. So, you know, I do think mm. that the habitats are, I mean, not always the richest. I mean, you can put, grow weeds or get into a national park and so you can say there are more plant species than you had before but these are international plants that are successful in many places of the world so having more dandelions because they've gone into a national park I don't, I don't, I don't think that's good enhancement mm. so um, I don't see us as a species that enhances in terms of natural areas but I think that we do diversify landscapes so that we think of our national parks as the places where we say, okay, let's really hold the line here. And then we turn around and say, well, all these humanised landscapes that we've got, let's um, organise them in the way that is most useful to other species. Mm. And that when we do that, we particularly focus on species in need. So, I mean, one of the problems we have is that, uh, you know, there are all these species that are just winners everywhere. I mean, you know, like my house has got cockroaches. Or you could say that, if my house wasn't here, if it was the original forest, these household cockroaches, they wouldn't be here. But I don't think anyone wants to celebrate the fact that we've now got all these cockroaches. So it is about species that we want to help and can help, like the, the ones that are doing badly. Um, and that is, in fact, hard to do. But, but I mean, that's you know, partly why I wrote the book, The New Nature, about how we can look around us at the new nature we're creating and try and help the ones that aren't doing well. Because, yeah, I mean, it's diversity. Diversity is good. You know, like mm -hmm. uh, the diversity of nature enriches my life. I get to experience a lot of different species looking around at what's mm. around me. And, mm. of course, it's good for them if they, they're allowed to continue. Mm. So would you might – what's your perspective then on perhaps humanity as – well, along our path of this bioevolutionary – um, how we fit into the greater web of life, I guess. Uh, uh, what's our bioevolutionary role there? Is it to be diversifiers from your point of view? I, I mean, I think that in the kind of spiritual approach to nature, there's so often a desire to think in terms of singularities. Mm. So you, you say to me, what is your view of nature? What is your view of wilderness? I say, well, really, there's nature, it's, there's, there's, it's a multiplicity. And then you say to me, say to me what, what, is, what is our role? What is the human role? And I'm thinking, you're asking me to give a singular answer. I mean, there is, there is no singular answer. I mean, I think that I'm part of the broader environmental movement. And I think that 
uh, everyone should be part of that movement. There's so much that we can do. And that for some people, that will be about um, campaigning to get plastics out of the ocean. For other people, that will be about trying to save species. Um, for me, it's about trying, well, particularly for me, it's trying to connect people to nature, make increase their awareness of other species, and also to understand how we can unintentionally and intentionally have bad impacts on them. And because it's not actually easy, you know, being green is not wood, you know, it's not easy. It's, mm. you know, there's so much that's counterproductive. So that is, that is my role, but it's not, mm. it's not someone else's role. So I think that mm. um, we, we have many, many, ro many roles. So, um. <laughs> yeah, look, that, that's a great reflection point for me because while I have that understanding that it is, or well, there's nuances and complexities. Sometimes when I ask a question, it can certainly come across from wanting to receive a, a single or an individual answer for someone. But yeah, I, I totally resonate with that question. But I'd love to go on a little bit of a different direction. And one of the big themes I'd love to explore with you is your work in where Song began. Your book, a very successful book, I might add, um, from what I understand, first published in 2014. Correct. Yeah, several subsequent editions, and I remember reading that the international edition uh, made its way into the scientific American list of recommended books. There was a wide-ranging uh, praise from many sources, many ornithological journals as well. So I guess there's a bit of a two-pronged question to you, Tim. For those that aren't familiar, what's the overarching theme or message in Where Song Began? And what were some of the initial things that you came across that prompted you to start writing this book? See, there you go again. What is, what is my, <laughs> my message? Jay, he's just pointing out all my flaws with my questioning. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> okay. Um, there, there is one, I suppose, theme that caught more attention than any other, which is the one conveyed in the title. So you know, the evidence that we now have saying that songbirds originated in Australia. So that if you, you know, <clears throat> I mean, in terms of international responses, one of the really nice ones was the Cornell Lab of Ornithology flying me to upstate New York to give a talk about this. But, you know, I can say to an American audience without any um, fear of being held down as sprouting nonsense that mm. all your you know, your beautiful singing birds, all the warblers in North America, the blue jay, cardinals, the crows and ravens, the swallows, all of those birds, you know, they, they have an Australian ancestry. And that if we look at the birds that have the most intelligence, so the really big songbirds like ravens and I mean, our magpies, just mm. amazing. Well, they'll play with dogs. I mean, play in birds, really mm. unusual. So big songbirds are really smart. And then you have all this amazing intelligence in large parrots as well. And that these two parrots and songbirds or perching birds, the group they're in, they're actually each other's closest relatives. And they both come out of the southern supercontinent Gondwana. Hmm. And a huge, well, maybe all parrots originated in Australia, or certainly a lot of them spread out of Australia, and all songbirds spread out of Australia. So Australia, you know, gave birth to the most intelligent birds. And that if you think back to song, I mean, songbirds, you know, we talk about what animals sing. So it's been recognised, say, that, you know, whales, that humpback songs, because they vary, because they learn from each other, they change them, that these qualify as songs. Mm. So I accept that. But if you listen to a humpback song, mm, you know, the humpback whale, it's not what we would call musical. If we think of just from a purely human perspective, I think it's some really nice crickets and frogs that are, they're quite musical notes, mm. but they're not really complicated enough that you would say that is music. But when you get to, um, oh, I mean, the heath wrens, uh, um, lyre birds, oh, I mean, just, the, oh, and the rufous whistler, it's just my favourite. It's just like this jazz musician that's just mm. going on, holding this note and going different places. And it's trying to impress the females around and about, or maybe one particular female, and it's really puffed up and I'm doing this, I'm going for it. You think, this? I can enjoy this so much. I mean, it's just such beauty, such power. And mm. this, it's intelligent. I mean, there's real skill. And, you know, I can appreciate this is skillful. It's not just accidentally nice. 
and that we haven't shared a common ancestor with birds for more than 300 million years. I mean, birds, their brains, they're amazingly different from ours, but to have this convergence where we share these aesthetic values that we can say, that is music. And then you think, if that is music, that is the first music, because birds have been around a lot longer than us. And it started in Australia. You know, we, we were the home of um, of song. So that that's uh, that's the title of the book. Mm. Yeah. Were you going to go on with something there, Tim? Oh well, um, you know, I gave that talk in the um, Corner Lab of Ornithology, and the book was reviewed quite quite a lot in North America and in Europe. And uh, and I gave a talk recently to a bird club in Boston. It was a, a Zoom talk, and I thought, I mean, in <laughs> In the book, I adopt a, a very much a kind of nationalistic tone. I sort of say, well, you know, we Australians were brought up to think of our wildlife as inferior, you know, the, the primitive, stupid marsupials. And I grew up with that as a kid. You know, like mm. I felt embarrassed that I really liked our marsupials. You know, it's like being in love with a, a teddy that only had three arms. You know, like it was, it was inferior. It was embarrassing to admit that you liked it. And then to think that we are the home of intelligent birds and that we've still got amazingly intelligent ones and so a uh, great sense of pride in that but that yeah. tone is in the book but i haven't had any americans or europeans contest that or be offended by it i mean they, they like it you know it's <laughs> <laughs> so i think yeah i mean the science is really good so no one's mm. questioning the science but also the idea that I mean, they would have been brought up the same way I was with the idea that the Northern Hemisphere, that's the superior part of the world, pumping out the best species. The idea that the Southern Hemisphere is important. Hey, every, everyone who's into nature likes, likes that idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a few threads there that I want to touch on. In particular, when we're talking about the sounds and the songs of birds, you know, when we're talking about some of our iconic Australian birds, we're talking about kookaburra, the cockatoos, lyrebird, cassowary the black and white maggie as you spoke to the emu you know countless others depending on what kind of biogeographical context we're talking about but one of the noticeable traits of some of these birds is the songs they make the sounds that they sing that can be very very distinct and i've heard you talk about this before and i would love for you to speak on what you've become aware about when it comes to any kind of uh this the bio uh bio evolutionary imperative that perhaps gives rise to some of these distinct calls or raucous calls that we might hear from the cockatoo or various parrots, for example? Well, I mean, one area of calling that I think is really interesting is uh, calls warning about predators. And hmm. there's a universal language here. So I've been in South Africa and I hear the bulbuls there, as, you know, birds that I don't know very well. And I'm thinking, they're upset. They're angry about something. They're calling over here, walked over, and thinking, I reckon there's a snake in that tree. And just look around, look around. Ah, and there's a boom slam. You know, the only time I've ever seen this deadly African snake is because the birds drew my attention to it. So um, there is this universal language that unites birds because they all will understand each other's language. So, I mean, one of the pretty amazing experiences I had just outside this house uh, was a big um big spotted gum uh, it was in full flower and so the um, there were lorikeets taking the nectar there were noisy miners and the noisy miners started their bird of prey call of, whoa, 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 whoa. now that's a call that they only use if there's something like a goshawk flying over something that will actually attack a bird from above mm -hmm. if there's a snake calling the calls are totally different cats different um, if they're just annoyed at each other, different again. And so I rush out thinking, oh, what, what kind of bird of prey it is. But what really struck me was that all the lorikeets froze when they heard that call. Like they, they knew exactly what it meant. And that if a goshawk's flying over, it's waiting for a bird to be spooked, dive on it, and all the birds just hunker down and stay still. And so I just watched that tree, goshawks gliding over the top. And then mm. after it had been gone about 20 seconds, the birds slowly start coming to live again and all that chorus is going on. I'm thinking, this is a wonderful thing. There's a three-way communication going on here. So the, um, I mean, the gospel would also recognise that call. So it would know that my chances of hunting here are really bad. I've been outed by the, by the um, noisy miners. So I will keep going in the, chance, in the hope of 
catching some birds unaware. So the noisy mind is communicating to the parrots, the lorikeets, and it's also communicating to me who goes outside and sees all this. And I think, this is my community. This is wonderful. And it's why, to some extent, I will defend the right of nature lovers to live in cities, that you can have this kind of experience in a city. I mean, it, you know, like that, that is really rich, enriching, I think. That, um, and, yeah, so the sense of I have a community and for a nature lover, it's not just the people, it's, it's the birds as well. They're, they're, talking, they're talking to me. Mm-hmm. Can, I, I'll tell you, can I tell you another story? Please. Oh, this is something that something just happened three weeks ago. So um, at the cabin in the bush, I was hearing this really weird little bird call. I thought, that sounds like a distress call. And so I thought it might be a snake. I think it was weebles that were calling. Went outside, looked all over the ground, saw nothing. Came back inside. Next day, I hear it again, nothing. Third time I heard it, I saw a tree snake. It was in a shrub. And that's why I missed it. I've been looking on the ground. Mm. And so what I did was I thought, when there's a snake, the birds will accept that you have the same interest in a snake as them. So um, they will let you get very close. So I walked up. So there were scrub wrens, little blue fairy wrens and thornbills. And by looking at the snake, I was able to get within a metre of those birds. And I was actually more interested in them than I was in the snake, just to see how close I could get by pretending that I was equally upset, you know, sort of hands on the hips. <laughs> <laughs> and in actual reality, I like the snake as much as I like the birds, but by pretending that I share their concern, they were willing to accept me really much closer than they would under any other circumstance. So I think that mm. shared community, you know, how's that? That's so funny that you mentioned that. I've had similar experiences just being out here on our land up in the high country. So I've become quite attuned to the rhythmic chirp or perhaps rhythmic chirp is not the best way to put it. It's more like a penetrating racket really (laughs) of the new Holland honey eater to alert me of disturbances in the area. And generally it's the cats kind of just following me through the garden beds. But more recently it was an Eastern brown snake that was slithering on through the veggie garden. And it was really interesting how they followed the threat through the garden beds and continued to chirp away until the, you know, the predator, the annoyance, the snake had made its way out of their, what I perceived to be their territorial boundaries. So in my instance, I was holding my two and a half year old. So the snake kind of cruised along a bit, but just by listening, it was really quite easy to find out whereabouts the snake was uh, hiding out. So I just saw its ta- uh, tail slink into a nearby shrub, but similar experiences with the cats slinking around too, where I can get very, very close to a lot of the New Holland honey eaters. And I'm not exactly sure why, but perhaps it's because of the same sentiments, if you will. The birds are like, oh, okay, this human's quite clearly annoyed with the cat as well. So we'll let him hang out nice and close. Well, I think they're hoping that you're going to kill, kill the, the cat, cat away. You know, yeah, maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess on that note, is there anything else that comes to mind off the top of your head when it comes to bird song or bird sound teaching you specific things about your local ecology? Well, I mean, the dialects are really interesting. I mean, if I've got currawongs here in Brisbane, currawongs in the bush cabin, totally different dialects. And then hmm. if I'm watching sometimes on the TV news, there have been stories where you can hear the currawongs calling from those concrete canyons in Sydney I mean that is such a different dialect and these currawongs they migrate around quite a bit so um, it must be really interesting to be a currawong and think what what all these different calls mean but I think you know so much of the time we're kind of knocking at the door trying to understand what they're saying and we 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 just can't (laughs) we just can't do it like that you know they have you know people talk about honey just having corroborees where they all get together and they're calling and people would think that that was about um, trying to decide how many young to have or where to go to breed, all these sort of things. And, I mean, these are kind of edgy ideas where you think, well, I haven't really got any evidence that that's the case. But, yeah, no, I wish I wish you could interview the birds eh? you know, just kind of ask them a few questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, when when I'm thinking about what it is that we're bringing our awareness to when we're in the field, I guess the two obvious things – that come to me are our visual line of perception and also auditory as well. But I guess 
what comes to mind is a guy called Tyson Yunkaporta. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. But he mm-hmm. recently wrote an interesting book called Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World. And he touches on the importance of relationships, uh, more specifically becoming aware of how certain nature beings are in relationship to one another, whether it's the bird that always hangs out on a particular tree or a grass that tends to grow down by the dam, which the blue wrens are constantly flitting in and out of, or, you know, I've just noticed a sacred kingfisher down by, I call it the mini lake. It's just, it's a rather large dam, but I noticed that sacred kingfisher down there yesterday afternoon. So I'm looking forward to noticing the patterns and the way in which I'm noticing relationships between the kingfisher and, you know, everything else in the environment. So I guess um, what what I'm getting at here is the the importance of noticing relationship links when we're wanting to develop more of a understanding or awareness or our own relationship with the interconnected web of life, if we will. So I guess the question in here, perhaps it's something to do with what what comes to your awareness when you are out in the field? Is there anything specific that you're kind of becoming aware of? Oh, I, I think the, once again, you're going for the singular and I'll give you the, the multiple answer. Please do, yes, please I mean, there's do. many things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so in terms of associations, I mean, I um, many years ago did work for Brisbane City Council. They brought in vegetation protection ordinances where they're um, uh, making it illegal for people to clear remnant bushland on rural properties without a permit, you know, just to mm. try and save the bush and the landscape. And it was really interesting, this area, Brookfield, Pullendale, there was all this rainforest, remnants there, dry rainforest. And, um, of course, it's not, you know, it's on the better soil, so soil types. I mean, I could see these lines running through the landscape, and mm. there was one edge where a valley had been cut right on the edge between the two soil types, and it was the edge of the catchment, the creek running down. I mean, these um, vegetation relationships where... Uh, the black soil's got the rainforest and the sandy soil's got eucalypts. Mm. Um, you know, you, you starting starting with the ground level, the nature of the terrain, you know, one eucalypt, one set of trees will like the eroding ridge, another set of plants will like where silt is accumulating. And, of course, ecologically, um, mm. it starts with soil, lie the land, water, um, fires, how many fires have gone through. I mean, you can come to an area where, so there's a whole lot of blady grass in a huge field. You think, whoa, this place is getting burnt way too often. Or, you know, whipstick wattles, a whole grove of wattles have come up. And you think that was a really hot fire. It mm. got all the um, old, all the wattle seed that was sitting in the soil. It um, breached their, their kernels. So they, they will germinate in the Great Flush. It was, it was not a mild fire. It was a really hot one. So, yeah, there's a huge amount of interpretation of the landscape. I mean, looking at scratches on eucalypts koala has been there i mean mm. it's it's almost make-believe but i reckon sometimes you can you can pick sugar glider scratches on some eucalypts you know like a little mm. little scratch and pour about that wide and you can think, mm. i think i'm looking at where a sugar glider has been and then you know the birds telling me where um yeah you know where, where interesting animals are like a, like a ring tail that's come out of its nest yeah i, mm. I think that there's this layer upon layer of that mm-hmm yeah, yeah, many layers. Yeah, something that I wanted to jump back to, you just jogged my memory, actually. You mentioned that Australia was part of the, what do we call it, the supercontinent, Gondwana? Gondwana. Which was, yeah, Gondwana. So that was connected to, what, Antarctica and South America, roughly at least 50 million years ago, from what I understand. Correct, correct. Yeah. I mean, before, if you go really early on, it was also connected to Africa, Madagascar, India. Sure. But that, yeah. that was so early, it doesn't really matter to the wildlife that we have. Yeah, and yeah we, so, we've got a lot of plants that look nearly the same in South America as we have here. So what was it about Australia then that the songbirds and the parrots arose out of here and then went on to populate the rest of the globe? What kind of environmental factors were there? And I'm guessing there were many. <laughs> You're learning. <laughs> yeah, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Just catching myself before you chime in. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, I, I don't think there's any answer to that. So... Um, I, I, I couldn't think of anything. I mean, you know, like I was writing that book where something began over 12 years. It was a lot of time to mm. really think it through. Couldn't come up with anything. And um, a lot of scientists have gone there, you know, into the actual 
genetics and the fossil evidence, but no one, no one's offered any suggestion. I tell you, you know, the end of the Cretaceous, you know, like the dinosaurs going extinct, there was that mm. huge um, meteor that smashed into Yucatan Peninsula. Mm. And so, you know, we don't really know exactly what happened, but one of the theories was that there was huge extinctions out radiating out from that area, and that if you were in Australia, then there are a lot of places. Mm. Um, but the evidence from New Zealand is that it was really bad there, so mm. yeah, no answer. Mm. Yeah, well, touching on dinosaurs, you know, when I was younger, for many years as a child, it was my dream to become a paleontologist, which was spurred on by the likes of you know, Dr. Alan Grant from Jurassic Park and, you know, of course, many other books on dinosaurs. And I came to learn that through the process of science and evolutionary biology that birds are the descendants of a particular branch of dinosaurs. But it wasn't until my early to mid-20s, say, that I actually got a real visceral sense um, that they were descendants. And it was up on up in the rainforests just outside of Hillsville, here in Victoria, and it was through watching these two lyrebirds. They appeared out of the scrub. They perched up for a moment and made their iconic uh, symphonic sound, and then they bounded off with this rhythmic bobbing of their head with their long tail feathers trailing behind. And I was like, wow, that is remarkably dinosaurian. So I got a real taste of it then, and of course, there are many other birds around the globe that still look quite prehistoric. There's the cassowary, the shoebill off the top of my head. But, you know, I, I guess I'm curious to hear you speak a little bit about the the prehistoric nature of some of the birds that we see today, like the lyrebirds, and if there's anything out there that we can see today that's still, that's kind of like, uh, that would still look quite similar from, you know, many, many millions of years ago. I mean, I, I guess I'd, I'd pick the cassowary that if you put a tail on it, that's a pretty good dinosaur. I mean, if you mm. just look at cassowary legs, they've got the scales, you know, it's mm. like ripped scales. You know, you think of chicken feet, you know, they're mm. covered in scales. There, there's that relationship. But, um, yeah, yeah, they've come a long way. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was one species of dinosaur. It was a pretty, pretty small... You know, a pretty small survivor mm -hmm. and birds have been through more than one bottleneck because um you know there, there were early birds that had teeth you know all these things mm -hmm. flying around big mm -hmm. chunky teeth but they, they all went extinct and so there was just one bird that survived out of them so there have been these amazing stories of um just so much biodiversity loss and mm -hmm. of course we're seeing some of that now with so many extinctions because of people more to come mm. Yeah, it's funny that you say that they've been through various bottlenecks and that they used to have teeth quite clearly coming from the lineage of dinosaurs. But we just went to pick up some little baby ducklings the other day and the farmer who we got them off had a whole, what are they called, a cackle of geese? I can't remember what the plural word is, but uh, he pulled one of them over that was blind and he showed us inside its mouth and along the ridges of its beak, it still had the remnants of little teeth and even along its tongue. It had these very strange backwards, like serrated, uh, I don't know what you call it, a serrated tongue that he told us that they they use that to kind of grab onto the grass and shovel it down the back of their throat. So I guess you can still see it to some degree in various bird species. Yeah, I mean, it's odd. If you look at the um, phylogenetic tree, birds are more closely related to turtles than turtles are to lizards. And we, we are more closely related to lungfish than lungfish are to mullet and cod. But I'm not, I'm not sure if those <laughs> comparisons really mean much. It's just the nature of the branching trees that, um, mm. you know, like lungfish, lungfish have shared a common ancestor with us more recently than they've shared a common ancestor with, mm. a, yeah, with a cod. Well, how... How are they determining this aside from looking at common ancestors? What kind of factors are there? I mean, I guess uh, they're obviously, I'm guessing they're looking at DNA as one of the factors. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. That's right. It is just working out the branching pattern. I mean, you can work it out from fossils as well. That um, We evolved from 
something very vaguely. I mean, we evolved from fish. So mm. which branch of fish did we evolve from? I mean, we didn't evolve directly from fish, but, you know, mm. fish going back through amphibians to fish. So which group of fish did we evolve from? It was the ones closest to lungfish and the coelacanths. Mm. So we end mm. up being closer to them than they are to other fish by mm. virtue of that. Yeah, sure. Well, I guess while we're on the topic of Gondwana, I'd love to hear you speak a little bit about, I either heard you speak about this or I've read it somewhere, the Gondwana gum trees, how we've found uh, the, the, pre the prehistoric link between Australia, Antarctica and South America and how we've found these 50 odd million years old gum nuts and gum leaves and the, the gum blossoms. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, yeah, I think it's really funny. So this is some fossil site in Argentina. I mean, you look at the fossils that come up. We, these are the oldest eucalypt fossils <clears throat> found anywhere in the world. And there they are in Argentina at a time when we know that Australia was connected through Antarctica and Antarctica was warm. I mean, they found platypus fossil over there. Um, hmm. And so I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not committed to this theory, but one of the... <laughs> One of the theories I've read about coming from Australian biologists is that eucalypts evolved over there first and that their love of fire, their capacity to survive where there's a lot of burning is because this site was a huge um, volcanic area. You know, there was big mountains spewing out lava. And so it's in, I think it's kind of ash from volcanic eruptions that eucalypts actually learned how to live with fire by growing around South American volcanoes and then travelled across to Australia. <laughs> this is a time when, I mean, they would have grown around the edge of Antarctica where it would have been warmer. And, and you know, there would have been giant penguins in the water. Like, so Antarctica had giant penguins then. But the idea of gum trees waving over giant penguins in Antarctica and platypus swimming around, it's crazy. But there are all these links. You know? Our freshwater turtles have got their nearest relatives there. Our green tree frogs have got near relatives there. There's mm. hundreds of these connections. Mm. Yeah, and to so me, I'm... that's a lie. And I, I'm glad you're asking, glad you're asking about that because I think in terms of humans forming a connection with nature, I think that the whole idea of, of deep time, I mean, we need to understand deep time <clears throat> to be decent environmental managers. I mean, the idea of you know politicians saying, oh, I will do this because I will win the next election and do something before the election in three or four years time i mean that short-term thinking we know that that's ridiculous but you know we're kind of stuck with that mm. system but to be good environmental managers we, we've got to be able to think through deep time and so mm. the gondwana relationship it's really uh well for australians that's a real pathway into thinking about that i think you know like it's very alluring you could say it's almost a spiritual word it, you know it's kind of kind of resonates with these deep meanings about ancient journeys and that it is just so important for us to be deep time thinkers so that mm. um, in terms of looking around the landscape we're not just thinking about what I'm doing right now but you know like if I plant this weedy plant is it just going to spread across the landscape and in 50 years time I've made a terrible mistake we have to think on that mm. scale. Mm. And these fossils that they found they were remarkably similar to the well to the aesthetic qualities of gum trees today is that right well big long sickle leaves they're a bit they were longer than typical australian gum leaves but i've looked at photos of the flowers the gum nuts and the gum leaves and you don't have to do any kind of oh yeah that's gum leaf and it just hits you you know you're looking at mm. eucalypts so mm. oh yeah they're they're totally convincing and it means yeah. that um when we look at the gum trees around us right now, they haven't really changed their look. I mean, some of them have, but your typical mm. gum tree, I mean, that, that, is, that is a Gondwana tree. That, that is not that much younger than the last dinosaur. So that, that is a really old, um, old architecture that we're looking at. And that is so different from what we're all taught because, you know, we've been taught that the rainforest is a Gondwana habitat. Then as Australia got dry, we got more fire, and then the eucalypts are the new vegetation that took over. But in actual fact, the eucalypts would be older than a lot of our rainforest trees. And that's mm. something that people haven't begun to wrap their heads around, the idea of eucalypts as being really old 
Australians, which makes them very different from the wattles. The wattles are the young ones. Mm. Wattles have come in from Asia and they've just boom, exploded really recently. Mm. And the, the eucalypts are, are much older. And then the grass is growing underneath, like kangaroo grass. I mean, the DNA is saying that hasn't even been in Australia for two million years. It's so new. It's just so wow. young. So I, I like the idea that um, let's say you're visiting a really historical city like London. I mean, you could um, go to the Tower of London. That's this day. You could go to a Tudor house that's much younger. You can see architecture of all different ages right up to the last 10 years. And that you can do that in the Australian landscape. You, know, you can go into a forest and say, well, this um, hoop pine I'm looking at, I mean, that's, that's Jurassic architecture. I mean, that's probably the oldest style of tree in the landscape. Mm. Um, then Antarctic beaches that might come second. That's you know they may be sixty million years old or architecture. If you look at the um, Nothofagus moria in northern New South Wales, that leaf design is really old. And then you come right down to things that just evolved a million years ago that are really new. And so for me, the bush has got that element of just multiple ages, things mm. that have been around for different amounts of time. Not not only in terms of when that architecture when that form evolved but how long they've been in my particular area so something old could have turned up recently so mm. a lot of old australian conifers they've now moved into indonesia they're right up on the high mountains of borneo these are australian trees that have moved into asia I and mean, it's i think it's just really exciting all these journeys wow yeah that's that's really interesting so it's not all that unreasonable to suggest then that you know looking outside and seeing the classic eucalypts that the songbirds and the parents, parrots of old have co-evolved with similar looking trees for many, many millions of years. Oh, it's certainly true of the birds. The birds are much younger than eucalypts. So um, the first birds, so now, you know, we've got lorikeets and honey eaters on our flowers, but they would have been totally different birds doing that if you go back 50 million years. So yeah, there's been a really high turnover, much more stability in evolution in plants. I think plants are, are simpler and I think plants i mean i think there are kind of limits on what you can do like i don't think you're ever going to see a bird evolving that's as smart as a human just because a brain as smart as ours needs to be so big that you wouldn't get it in a flying animal so mm. there, there are kind of ceilings on where some lineages mm. can go but that in terms of plants i think they reach right to the edges of what they're really good at a really long time ago for a lot of them so that you know Hoop pines, that is architectural design that goes back right into the age of dinosaurs. The hoop pines are really common. Like they're a really successful tree. You know, they're found all the way from central New South Wales right up into North Queensland as a really common tree. So this design that, well, it's quite possible that long column shape is hmm. happening when Australia, Gondwana was much closer to the, um, to the South Pole. So the winters were quite dark. So the best shape is to be really, really tall, have your leaves up high, so that if the sun's just coming down over the horizon as you're coming out of winter, you can hit that light early. So you, in a hoop pine, it's quite likely that you're looking at a design that evolved down in Gondwana near the South Pole, but it's still totally different climate, totally different location on the planet, but it's still a really good design because it, it really grew up photosynthesizing and breeding and so on. Yeah, it's mm. just wonderful, this, this continuity. It's such a privilege. You know, you, you want to see something Jurassic, just look at a hoop pine. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah that's fascinating. Bun you know, bunyip pines. So bunyip pines are in the same genus, Araucaria. They're equally old. They have found part of a bunyip pine cone fossilised in England from the Jurassic. Mm. Now, that is actually impossible. You couldn't possibly have bunyip pines. We know that bunyip pines not the oldest lineage, but... I've seen a picture of this fossil and think, it's a bunny pine. Like it's it's just, it is part of a bunny pine. But it means that, and I think in evolution designs come and go, like, you know, it's good to talk about lineages sometimes rather than species that, you know, something can, as climate change comes along, eucalypts, you know, they're cross-pollinating, evolving and this and that. Um, if you look at like mountain ash in Victoria, if you look at the climate modelling during the ice ages, there was nowhere suitable for mountain ash. There was nowhere that was warm and wet enough so and mm. probably was sitting inside some other species there's something different and they've just they evolved in a certain direction where it suits them so i think but yeah um hoop pines that's yeah that 
that to me has the real spiritual dimension, the idea that I can look at a design that is, you know, about 90 million years old. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's really, really interesting. So when we're talking about something like trees, plants, <clears throat> ecological niches, I've seen you write that birds stand out in a variety of different ways from, what was it you mentioned, four different things, ecological, behavioral, uh, evolutionary, and biogeographical perspectives, so much so that we can learn a lot about Australia from our birds, perhaps rather than our mammals. What's, why is that so? Oh, well, in terms of that story of spread, so songbirds and parrots spreading out of Australia. I mean, if you look at our mammals, our mammals haven't really gone anywhere. So in terms of biogeography, there's less to learn. Right. Um, yeah, I think um, they're really powerful ecological players. So in terms of when we had the megafauna, our mammals would have been more powerful. But if you look at the birds today that are capable of killing forests. So, you know, we have bell miners. Um, forests can get sick and die because they allow this buildup of these sort of bugs. Cockatoos that will ring back trees. Um, our birds are really, really ecologically powerful. And I think if you look at our most powerful birds, they're actually more ecologically powerful than our most powerful mammals. I think, you know, so I think in terms of seeing how much an animal can influence an ecosystem. But here in Australia, um, bell miners, the fact that whole forests get sick and die, I mean, that is like, wow. You're seeing mm. the power of bugs that are being protected by birds that are sucking so much sap that the trees weaken and die. The possibility of that happening, you, you wouldn't get that lesson from looking at our mammals. Mm. Mm. Yeah, okay. So this ties into a question that I wanted to ask you and you know, it's tying into some of your other books. So we're kind of jumping around a bit here, but from Feral Future and then what was it? The New Nature. That's the title of your book, isn't it? So Well, that's that's where I talk about animals yeah. and cities exploiting us and how, how sure. we've helped bell miners by logging forests. Sure. Well, I guess this kind of ties more into Feral Future then. So uh, you know, and this, all these conversations are such nuanced conversations, but, you know, how does this tend to tie into the species of birds that have been introduced and that we may now call invasive species? I mean, there are so many environmental impacts and what is it that comes to mind that you think, you know, we as lay people or in environmentalists or people that care about nature should be becoming more aware of and you know what do you see in terms of practical solutions and how we can move forward well yeah i mean feral future is about introduced species causing harm it's very difficult to do a lot about the species that are always they're already here so mm. um stopping cats from killing wildlife oh really hard really tough stuff but we've created this incredibly mobile world and we saw the way that COVID 19 I mean, it was a frequent flyer, you know, like the, the way it was hitting all these um, world leaders really fast, you know, like it was, um, you know, it's traveling first class, really getting around. But we've created these systems of enormous mobility. And we have all these hitchhiker species that are able to exploit the globalized world we've created that can do us great harm and biodiversity great harm. And I mean, I think it's the ants that are the really spectacular example of that. But if you said to the average environmentally aware Australian, what conservation issues concern you that most of them are not gonna mention ants. But if you look at the, um, there's an $800 million operation to eradicate fire ants from around the Brisbane area, because these ants, they have just done so much harm to the way of life of Americans across the Southern states. Uh, they cause so many electrical problems. They're attracted to electricity. They cause short circuits and computers, air conditioning mm. units, major economic pests, major threat to biodiversity. And there are all these ants traveling around really effectively. And so Australia is waging all these wars, trying to push back all these species of foreign ant, which form these incredible densities in the landscape. And there are all these other ants that we should be keeping out. But people aren't focused on that. That is not. That, that is not a, an issue that 
gets much thought from the average person. But um, mm. if you think about COVID being a wake-up call in terms of um, uh, virulent diseases, mm. it, there's a, a larger issue in COVID. There's a larger lesson to be learned. It is about we've created these systems of mobility whereby it could be spiders, seeds, diseases like myrtle rust, Things are just zapping around the world using our transportation systems. And it means that all the species that can do the most harm have got, well, if, they, if they're good at travel, they can get around. So there's a kind of ants, all of the worst ants are moving around and pushing each other out and battling. It's, mm. it's I mean, eco ecologically, it's amazing, but it's, it's pretty scary stuff. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean... What's the, what's the question I want to ask here? Where do we draw the line? Or it seems like there's very blurry lines, you know, when it comes to, you know, we've throughout our evolutionary path, we've already created or caused a lot of ecological disaster. And then at what point do we keep intervening to try and stop that from happening? And then w at what point do we kind of distance ourselves and let nature take over and do her thing as she does and use the, you know, the, the self organizing perhaps mechanisms as a, uh, you know, as a as an earthly organism, you know, she's uh, from what I understand, from what I observe, there's patterns and programs at play where she sorts things out. So, you know, where does kind of the anthropocentric kind of world model and taking a, you know, taking a hands-on approach versus backing off, like, how does this all come into play? Well, see, you're going back to the singularity again, Mother Nature. She, what does she do? Her self-organizing principle. I think, what is this stuff? There, there is no she. There is no self-organizing principle every species has got its own agenda you know like they're all you know we, we all as individual people we, we can work together as a community but there are times when my neighbors want to have a loud party and that isn't really what i want i mean mm. but we're still we can still be friends and be part of a community but um you can't stretch that idea too far i mean the idea of saying well feral cats are out in the landscape let's accept them as our friends and neighbours. I mean, if they are causing the extinction of numbats, these amazingly special animals only found in Australia, which were once found in Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia, and now extinct except in small areas of Western Australia where they're being threatened by cats. I mean, I know the kind of um, sentiments you're talking about, the idea that there is this positive self-organising force in nature I don't see that. I mean, how, how do you apply that to cats killing numbats in southwestern Australia? They would be extinct by now if it wasn't for, you know, human intervention. I mean, you know, people have bred them up and moved them to new places and, and killed a lot of foxes and killing cats to keep them alive. I mean, you know, we have a moral responsibility not... I mean, you know, the numbat is so different from all other marsupials when you ask, what is its closest relative? It's the thylacine, you know, the Tasmanian wow. tiger. That's its closest relative. So in terms of a, a, a special evolutionary lineage, wow, mm. it's mm. it's big. We, we can't mm. lose that. And, you know, mm. and I kind of hippie shit philosophy would let me say, I, I'm willing to see cats wipe out numbats because that's where that philosophy goes. Mm. Yeah, so what you're saying then is that human intervention in various aspects is certainly needed to to clean up the problems that we've introduced. Well, I think I think everyone ultimately knows that. No one really. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you saw a dog, a, a pack of dogs surrounding a koala that were mauling it, no one's going to or let's say they're wild or, or let's say they're foxes, a, a bunch of foxes mm. attacking a koala. No one's going to say, oh, this is nature doing its thing, I'm going to stand back from that. Of course you wouldn't do that. Or, you know, if you see, um, yeah, well, you know, there's all sorts of situations. We're intervening all the time. You know, there's, we're always going to have to intervene. We, we can't help that. Mm. So, I mean, what are some of the bigger problems when it comes to the feral invasive species here in Australia? I guess it might be different because you're up there in Queensland as opposed to mm. down here in Victoria. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I, I travel around. So the chytrid fungus that got in that... Um, wiped out a whole series of frogs. So you know, I've been onto Mount Mount Borbo, not not that far from um, Melbourne, where you've got mm. the Mount Borbo frog. It's nearly nearly extinct because it's highly susceptible to this disease. There's this one little stream where the disease hasn't got in, they're captive breeding at Melbourne Zoo. 
And I mean, this awful fog, it's nearest relatives, they're up in northern New South Wales. I mean, this is, this is an old Gondwanan survivor, really special. And yeah, there's huge efforts to try and breed them, get them back into. So there was logging in some of the streams on Mount Borbor. It looks like the mm. logging knocked them out. The chytrid fungus, this um, disease that's come out of Asia, it hasn't been found in that stream. So breed them up, put them in there. That's good. That's, that's kind of intervention we should do. So diseases are really bad. The other one being myrtle rust, you know, this disease that got in from South America that some rainforest trees, they're just vanishing out of forests everywhere. And it's really terrifying. So we have to, um, have, to have to breed these trees and get their seeds into storage, some of these in, in, the, in the eucalypt family. I mean, a lot of environmental of this space. I mean, diseases, they're, they're yucky, they're, they're icky things. It's, you know, it's not nice. Um, and I think a problem in terms of people fighting them also is that in the environmental movement, that the problem starts with us. You know, humans have disrupted, we've messed things up. And so people think, well, I want to stop human harm. So I want to oppose land clearing, reduce emissions, stop bad human behaviors mm. but often the problems are actually from other species like these diseases these ants like feral mm. cats and so a lot of people are uncomfortable with that that um, you're actually shifting your focus from the people that initiated the problem onto the ants because we have to stop these ants mm. and that, that's not the same as um you know, stopping the evil businessmen with big bags of money and puffing on cigars. You know, it's not mm -hmm. the image of evil that we might have started out with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you mentioned the transport systems before, how these things seem to get around on a, you know, on a global level. So what, what were you talking about there, the transport systems? Are you talking about humans flying, humans carrying cargo from this place to that place? Yeah, yeah, all of that. I mean, it's interesting that when... When we moved into a really globalized world, there were a lot of environmentalists who spoke out about the bad impacts on third world communities. So you had issues like, um, uh, let's say, um, rich countries exporting all their waste to poor countries, you know, like Bangladesh, and China, when it was poorer. And so that, that got a lot of focus. Um, but there's also this other issue that um, ships are now moving around so fast that they're carrying all these marine creatures in their ballast tanks and the ballast water. And so now all our harbours are getting these weird animals from around the world. I mean, mm. there are so many environmental impacts of trade that we don't think about. And this is part of the border. You can call this nature if you like, but um, there's a lot of this bad stuff going in. So the mobility we've created in the world has a real downside. Now, you saw that with COVID-19. If COVID-19 had arisen in China 500 years ago, it would have stayed there. It would have stayed there for hundreds of years because you didn't have the mobile world. But because we've made the world so mobile that I feel entitled to go on my holidays to another continent, then all this stuff's going with it. So, you know, it's easy to smuggle reptiles and things. You know, like corn snakes, these American snakes, are now wild around Sydney because people have smuggled them in. Mm. What do you think of the little phrase, think global, act local? Well, we've got to act global as well. So um, mm. thinking, I think the problem with thinking local is that it's small scale. And so when I talked about we've got to think through deep time, that is about thinking big. And so I think when we look at, um, uh, yeah, our ecological footprint, it can have impacts all, all over the world. So for example, Australian government agencies have promoted our wattles as really good trees to grow in places where there's a lot of soil erosion. So they're growing a lot of Australian wattles in Africa, Asia, South America. Now these wattles are now picking up diseases in these foreign countries. And if these diseases get back to Australia as myrtle rust is done, we're just going to have all these dying wattles. Now, we have to think ahead about that kind of situation. And I think that thinking local, it's not, it's not enough. You know, it doesn't get you into that kind of um, foresighting frame where you're thinking about the implications. I mean, we are just giants in a crockery shop. And, you know, we have to uh, you know, be looking at all levels of it and the way, the way we interact and, you know, mm. I throw a ping pong ball here, but how, how far does the bouncing 
go mm. around the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you were saying think local. I'm not sure if I said that, but from what I understand, the phrase is think global while act act doing our best. Yeah, while doing our yeah. best to act local. Yeah. Okay, I'll give, another, I'll give you another example where I think that's really limited. So, mm. okay, a lot of people think there's an environmental crisis. I want to help. <clears throat> I'm going to put a frog pond in my backyard. I'm going to plant some flowers to attract birds. I sort of think that is acting local, but it's not it's not actually very useful like there's not many kinds of frogs that are going to turn up in your backyard if you're living in an urban environment as is the case for a lot of people doing that not many birds are going to turn up if you work on a bush care revegetation in your local area if it's near forest you can do so much so much better so i mean the most local you could be is your backyard but that if you go a bit beyond local too the forest out there you can do much more so yeah i think that that any any kind of simple truism it'll, it'll, it'll take you a certain distance it can be good in some ways but yeah sure the idea you know the idea of you know like 10 rules for ecological living or this is my guiding principle i mean i think that i mean i think you know like you look at donald trump you know like use the slogans it's stupid you know like 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 you know we, we need to recognize that every situation is complex and look, look at look at the complexity yeah how many different ways can i look at this how much can i say about this mm. yeah like i've mentioned a couple of times even though some of my questions may may not have alluded to it <laughs> nuanced complexities and uh, look i guess this is I'd, I'd love to start to wrap things up and since we're kind of touching on some of the practicalities you know, the logistics, I, I want to ask you about that, you know, and you said that, you know, there's, there really is no 10 steps to become more of a ecologically attuned, you know, human being walking on the planet. But I mean, are there any suggestions that you typically offer up to people when it comes to fine tuning our awareness and becoming more sensitized to, well, a large part of what we were talking about is our bird filled environments, but not just our bird filled environments, but how to walk forward in, you know, in harmony, but with that understanding that it's a dynamic world that we live in. I, okay, I guess one thing I would say is that when I look at people's relationships <clears throat> to nature, often they seem to me very shallow. You know, so people say, oh, I love nature, but they don't know much about it. And that's easy to understand because um, it's, it's so damn complicated. And, and so, I mean, to have a, for me, real depth in relationship comes from having a lot of understanding so you know standing out of doors in the morning and knowing all the bird calls think oh there's a fantail cuckoo calling in that valley i hadn't heard one for a few weeks one's moved in and then i might hear a fantail cuckoo for the next four or five days then i don't hear it again i thought oh maybe it was thinking about breeding but it's moved on but you know for me to that the little stories in the landscape i have to know the bird calls and so there is a learning curve and that's off-putting. So I think that that investment, you know, if you think of a lot of people will think, well, I really would like to get fit. They go jogging once. It's horrible. You know, they come back all sweaty, <laughs> legs are tired. So they give up. And, of course, you know, we all know that there's a hump to get over that the first 10 times you go mm. jogging. And, I, and by the way, I do jog. I mean, I'm <laughs> not saying nature or jogging. You do both. <laughs> uh, uh-huh. I believe in jogging. It's good. Cardiovascular, you need it. Mm-hmm. But, um, so, with, you know, nature appreciation, it's a big hump. It's like jogging. Uh, you, you, to really get a lot out of it, you have to invest a lot of time into trying to understand and learn it. Fabulous resources out there, yeah. books, websites, people to talk to, organisations, local naturalists. But I think, you know, natural history, it sounds so old-fashioned, but, hey, you know, don't you, it's good stuff, you know, like, like the sense of being out in nature and not being totally dumb about what you're looking at, but you know, having some sense of, yeah, and I know I can understand that scene. I have a bit of knowledge about how, why the birds are doing that with that plant because I know that plant and I know those birds. So mm. that is really enriching is that larger sense of community. But, yeah, make the commitment. It's, it's mm. worth it. Do you have any resources that you might suggest when it comes to teachers or books that people might want to follow up with after listening to us? Carry on. Yeah, it depends on what species. I mean, I think people have basically got to pick a group. Like I'm, you know, I'm into 
reptiles, mammals, birds, the whole the whole lot. Um, mm. You can't just suddenly get into all that. So um, you're going to have to say, well, maybe, maybe I'll pick birds and maybe I'll pick some of the local flowering shrubs. You know, you, you've got to choose. But mm. there's there's lots of resources. You, you know, you can just go online and find out. You know, review, review bird guides, that kind of thing. Mm. So, I mean, the, the resources are great. Australians produce really good wildlife guides. We're, we're not we're not as good as the British, but we are good. Mm. Mm. So I guess I'd love to ask then, and I suspect that the list is quite numerous indeed. But off the top of your head, who have been some of your greatest teachers? Um, I suppose if we want to go right back to the more spiritual end of things, I think that, you know, like Americans will talk about themselves as the home of nature writing. So I think Aldo Leopold is the nature writer who's been most um, influential on me. So um, Sam County the Almanac, I mean, it's a bit of a, a ramble. It's mm. all over the place. But he talks mm. at one place about Draba. He talks about <clears throat> bending down and there's this tiny little crest of a plant that grows about two inches high and it's a tiny little weeny flower a couple of millimeters he said someone discovered this plant and they they described it they spent 10 minutes on it and then they forgot all about it and but here it is it's just doing its thing un, unnoticed by the wider world we come and go but there it is and i mean that just speaks to me so much that you can get you can lie down on the ground sometimes and there's some tiny little plant just you know three centimeters high with one little flower on the top so, well what are you doing what are you about like you've got your own agenda your millions of years of evolution and yeah I mean, i've forgotten what question you asked but um, <laughs> just, it was just, in regards just, to your teachers oh, as well yeah yeah, you're, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah so that's all the leopold like yeah appreciate appreciate that little plant mm. um i think um I think the thing, I mean, I, I've emphasised field guides, but they've all actually gotten so much better than when I started that the, the identification guides I was using when I was young, they're not the ones that I would recommend now. So, so they haven't, haven't been that, um, haven't been that influential. In Australia, do we have Australian geographic field guides or any kind of stock standard field guides that we'd want to look to, or are there many different companies that produce these? Uh, well, there's, we've got five bird guides in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you want a if you want a really small one, I like um, Peter Slater the best. But I, I'm Peter. Peter died not that long ago. I knew him better than any other field guide artist. So mm -hmm. I feel a personal attachment to him. When he was actually painting that field guide, he showed me he had um, an Italian carpet catalogue. So there's some really rare big book of a thing which had hundreds of different colors for carpets and he was actually using that to mix his paints to do the different <laughs> birds but but yeah he's got a really nice compact guide that i'd like to carry around so that'll do you that'll do you well but there's 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 other guides as well i, I don't mm. want to move on um, i mean for reptiles um steve steve wilson's field guide i mean steve's a great mate of mine but i could be totally objective and say that that is that is the field guide to take to take in the field but I mean, with reptiles, I mean, this idea of Jesus, the idea that you've got to get a feel for a striped skink, knowing that that is the group of animals you're looking at. What is what is the feel of that group of lizards? That um, mm. something that if we had time, you, you would want to talk about. I mean, plant guides, it's the regional guides are often best. So it depends on what area of Australia you're in as to whether mm. you're well served with a field guide. Mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah and just while you're touching on that as well we'll just go on a slight tangent if you don't mind I, I would love to um just extrapolate that out what you were saying like it's it's becoming aware of what what do you want to call it a, a species or a yes. i'm not familiar with my taxonomy mm -hmm. but we're looking at a particular animal and we're like okay this is how or this is related to all of these other similar looking creatures and we can extrapolate that out to when we're looking at birds or any particular animal yeah, so I suppose you could you could talk about it as you know, classification or, or phylogeny. You know that mm. there was originally one parrot, and it evolved, 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 and now there's lots of parrots, but mm. they all have so much in common. I mean, they they all lay white eggs. I mean, there's no parrot that does anything else except lay white eggs. And of course, they've all got a similar bill. Now, what's really interesting is that 
in the classification tree, we now know that um, parrots and perching birds, songbirds, are each other's closest relatives. Uh, falcons are fairly closely related as well. And so that, oh, wow. that actual parrot beak, I mean, it looks like a falcon's beak, and it, it is actually because there was a common ancestor that looked like a falcon. So we didn't know that until DNA studies about 10 years ago. I mean, really, really recent. I mean, when I started writing my bird book, we didn't know that. But I mean, that's an example where I don't know whether it matters. I mean, you don't, you don't need to know that to enjoy parrots. But yeah, I think I think I find it interesting. Like it's just sort of like deepening deepening connections, you know, in a um, in a non-religious way that mm. jo joins up the dots. That you know, falcons and parrots they go together on one level. You can see it in their beaks. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. Well, are there any other? future projects that you have going on at the moment, Tim, or are you um, taking some much needed or much wanted kind of relaxation time after so many publications and so much work that you've done? I can't. I feel I've got three books left in me and I've got to get them out before I die. The last one took 12 years. So the, ra the race is on. Like I, I feel like I've accumulated experiences and knowledge and ways of thinking that I want to, want to really get it out there. But what I'm working on at the moment, it's a book on, it's another book on invasive species because I really think that we're, we're just not doing anywhere near well enough. Um, and yeah, you know, these ants, this myrtle rust, I wrote Feral Future back in 1999. I had almost nothing to say about ants and um, they're changing their social structures to fit in with us. I mean, there's one global colony of Argentine ants. It's, it, it, it's all across Southern Europe, all the way around um, the European coastline. If you get, let's say you've got a hundred ants out of a nest in Northern France, you could put some of them in a nest in Italy and the ants there would accept them as related. They're part of the same super colony. People have done this. You could put some of the ants in California, they would be accepted. They're accepted in Japan. They're accepted in Hawaii. They're accepted in Australia. It's all part of this huge global super colony people scientists ant scientists are talking about the existence of this giant ant super colony and this is just mind-blowing ecological change i don't mm. think everyone should know about this mm. but it's also these ants they're pushing out the little local native ants and so it's like wow i yeah i've got to write about this well it, that's interesting blows, blows me away Mm, I can see a similar pattern there between these ants and between uh, humanity as a species. Ab absolutely. And so we have become more global as a society, you know, common languages, universalizing religions. You know, if you think of before Christianity, each tribe would have its own, its own local, own local gods. You know, this, mm. these are our gods. And then you know, Christianity is a huge breakthrough, the idea that I am a God of all humans. So, Universalizing religions, Islam, um, 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 Buddhism, sp spreading, pushing out all these little minor um, religions. And that makes it easier for ants to do something similar, to become more homogenous around the world. Yeah, yeah, there's really important parallels. So mm. I think, um, you know, understanding ants helps us understand people, helps us understand ants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, my best wishes on the uh on the book writing i'm currently trying to um make my way through my first manuscript myself and i've been sitting at about 75 80 percent for some time but as i mentioned to you at the start of our conversation it's really hard to pry myself away from the gardens and sit down in front of a pen and piece of paper or the laptop so it's a slow process at the moment yeah i think i think it's a ratcheting up a guilt for me like if i'm not working <laughs> on the book I feel bad and then I have to look around me and think, is, is it, can I justify what I'm doing and not writing? And yeah, often mm. I think, no, go back to the desk, but I don't, but I don't work at night. So mm -hmm. I, yeah. I wouldn't sleep, wouldn't sleep if I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. Look, this has been a very, very interesting chat for me, mate. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing some of your knowledge with us all. So um, yeah, a big thank you, mate. Thank you, Kai. It's been great, great talking with you. But yeah, get into the pluralities. <laughs> Note taken. Yeah, I, uh, I'll reflect on that and take that in and accommodate accordingly <laughs> in future conversations and future interviews. No, it's, it's actually a really great tip.
So I don't mean it to come out like that. And my perspective no, uh, no, is not it's, geared towards that, but it's just the way that it comes out. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it is inherent in spiritual thinking, you know, the idea of oneness, of one, you know, one great idea that explains things. And yeah, um, I mean, yeah, if you think of nature, it is about a love of diversity and, I think, you know, diversity of thinking is part of that. Mm -hmm. And for but the yeah. listeners that are tuning in as well, I'll just say that I will have as many of the resources as possible that we have mentioned in our conversation up in the show notes. And I'll also link to your website as well, Tim, for people that want to check out more. And I recall that's timlow.com. Pretty simple. It is. Yeah. It is. Okay. Thank you, okay. Carl. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. absolutely. All right, mate. Well, until uh, we catch wind of each other again through the digital realms. Yep. You've got to do less nature and more time at the desk. <laughs> like a totally perverse thing to say, but, you know. Oh, mate, yes. I'm, I miss out on so much wildlife because I get stuck over a computer. You know, I love nature. And oh, well, fine. look, I mean, it's only because we moved in here six weeks ago so i just uh, feel as though i'm oh, i'm kind of on the back i'm on the front foot trying to get on top of everything for the growing seasons yeah, and yeah. everything else so you know when we were in our last place which was only four or five acres um over in hamilton which is southwestern kind of victoria yeah, no, uh, hamilton. there wasn't as okay there you go yeah there wasn't um, as last, much to do hamilton had the last bad bandicoots in mainland australia they were living right. in the rubbish tip I wrote about them in a new nature. Endangered yeah, okay. bandicoots in the Hamilton tip. Right. Well, I never did see the bandicoots out that way myself, even though there were plenty of signs along the walkway saying, look, watch out for the bandicoots. But mm -hmm. I certainly saw my fair share of platypus out that way. Oh, good one. Good one. Yeah, well, oh. well, we our four acres was right beside the creek, so it was just a you know, a two minute walk and we oh, had platypus wow. right there. Oh, so oh. it was lovely. Oh. Every single, yeah. almost every single day I'd see them. Wow. Oh, I've never heard someone say that. That's so impressive. Oh. Yeah. It was really, uh, really, really nice to see their habits on a daily basis and to see when they would start what I presume to be the male and the female coming together because I would see only one platypus in the stretch of creek for months on end. And then, you know, at a, a certain time of the year, I'd suddenly see a couple at various patches of the creek. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, they're a lot more active. They're clearly getting their nests ready to do their thing. Yeah, very so, interesting. I hope this will be an important part of your book. Yes, well, yeah, it's certainly something that I touch on. Yeah, like you yeah. said, I've got to get in front of my computer a little bit more, but it's challenging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyways, I'll probably have this conversation up within, um, you know, 48, 72 hours or something like that. So, yeah, I'm sure a lot of the listeners will be very, very interested. I did a post on one of my um, social media groups today saying that I was having a conversation with you and a lot of people were um, very, very pleased that you were going to be sharing your knowledge right. on the show. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah thanks. Luck. Yeah. Actually, I I, look, I, I met um, Haskell. I had dinner with him. So I watched. Ah, there you go. It was, it was great. He he was so good. I was so impressed by how he spoke. It was brilliant. Yeah. But, well, but I yeah, mean, that's yeah. part of the part of the challenge is for me to have these types of conversations is that I don't have an academic background. So mm. it, fe it certainly feels like I'm a fish out of water when I'm speaking to scientists and biologists and people with, you know, a lot of experience in uh, academia. But so you got it. You really got it out. You got it out of him. So that was great. Yeah. Well <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed that as well. Yeah. Uh, wealth of knowledge, and you know, he's he touches on so many interesting things as well. Some of the experiments that he's done with the yeah. trees and using technology in that way. It's very, really, very interesting. Really creative, original thinker. You know, you can see that he's mm. just thought things through so far. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we'll we'll stay connected, mate, and um, we'll chat again in good time. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank yeah. you. All right. Appreciate Bye. it, Tim. Have a nice evening, mate. You too.